And that means things like contemplating a walkout of state employees, contemplating a Chicago teacher strike. But he may have that. Contemplating patcoing some state employees. He may have that. Five years at WLS, and now, folks, he shook up the whole town. He went over to WIND, that 560 AM radio, also known as The Answer. Correct. What's the question, Dan? Uh, the, we have the answer to all of the questions. That's the point. Every so Monday through Friday, we nine a.m., five a.m. to you have yes, five a.m. to say it. Five a.m. to nine a.m. And what's the station? AM five sixty W I N D. The answer where the show is Chicago's morning answer. And who is the lovely lady who accompanies you to that uh, broadcast? And that would be Amy Jacobson. All right. Will I get in trouble for calling her a lovely lady? I don't think so. No. Most okay. people like to be called lovely, myself included. <laughs> lovely, really? Yes. The lovely Dan Proft is our guest. See, okay. I feel better already. Look, you got to stop fooling around. I mean, it's okay. Serious business. Serious business. So, so, you know, we come to the state impasse. Most people are talking about that. You've probably spent a lot of time on the radio talking about that. It started on July 1, right? The state budget impasse. I heard you speak at, the Illinois, at an event in Greektown, maybe when it was day eight, and now we're in day 56. We're going to do this like, what was that in Iran, 1979, when they took those hostages, 1980? Wow. Remember that? Like every day. That's what Rounder should be doing every day. This is not exactly a hostage-taking situation, um, but yes, there's an impasse, and for the first time in a long time, you have uh, a governor that is willing to kind of stand up to Mike Madigan and the established order in Springfield and say, we're not going to continue to deficit spend. We're not going to continue to pass unconstitutionally unbalanced budgets. And, uh, and uh, he's not working. He's, he's, and to his credit, he's not saying, well, I'm just going to govern by executive fiat and work around the General Assembly. No, he's saying the General Assembly has to be a partner in this. They have to be substantially involved. They have to be part of the decision making, the difficult decision making that has to be done when you have a state that is $214 billion in debt. And uh, thus, you have this impasse because you have two people who have benefited mightily from the status quo in Springfield for the past four decades, Speaker Madigan, uh, Senate President John Cullerton, and one person who was elected last year uh, on a promise to make the difficult decisions to advance a turnaround agenda and to build coalitions around that agenda. And I think if you had honest up or down votes, at least on some of the component parts of Rauner's turnaround agenda, you'd probably see them passed on to his desk. But you have bulwarks against progress in Springfield being the speaker, the center president, and the public sector unions that finance them. Which of the turnaround agenda items do you think, if you had an up or down vote, you would get the General Assembly to pass by a majority vote? Property tax freeze in some form or fashion, for example. But wait a second now, and describe to us what you mean by a property tax freeze. It's a little bit, it's a little bit seems peculiar, because many people would know we have property tax caps. We've had them probably for what, like 20 years or longer? And don't they limit local governments from spending local taxing units school boards, park boards, library boards, village, so forth, even the city of Chicago, don't they limit the property tax increase to 5% or consumer price or the consumer price index, whichever is less? So remember why Runner was elected. So everything we talk about has to be understood against the backdrop of system change in state government. If you're not talking about system change, then you're not talking about changing the trajectory of Illinois. And so whether you talk about property taxes or Medicaid or K through 12 education or how we invest in transportation infrastructure, any of these things, we have to understand none of them are financeable in their current form. And so everything should be a conversation about how we rethink how state government is doing the big things they're doing, public sector pensions as well. Okay, I understand you want system change. Well, I'm, I'm saying, I'm suggesting Ronner was elected based on the idea of system you think, change. You think... That's what the turnaround agenda is you think supposed those, to be about. So he won the election by 50% to 46%, something like that, right? Five percentage points, yeah. yeah. Or 51, 46. Mm -hmm. So you're saying all of those 51% who voted for Rauner, at least those 51% said they were in their mind voting for an entire system change. 
Because, you know, some people, just to be devil's advocate yeah. a little, some people say it was Pat Quinn who was so unpopular, people thought the state was so off track, going in the right direction. They wanted a change, but it wasn't well articulated in their mind, so it might be a bit presumptuous for, Look. it might be a bit, can I just finish the sentence? Yeah. And then you can start might be a bit presumptuous for Rauner and his supporters to think that because he got 51% and won by 5%, the whole state of Illinois wants tremendous change. Well, That's the question now. Yeah. The answer, as so, we say on WIND, yes. the answer. So, so the answer is this. One, elections are usually referendums on the incumbent. So the fact that people voted against Pat Quinn is nothing out of the ordinary when you've had a performance as bad as Pat Quinn did. Number two, every victor has a mandate. So, you know, the same, so the idea that uh, President Obama gets 51% of the vote or 52% of the vote and he has a mandate, but Bruce Rauner does at the, at the state level in Illinois and he doesn't, of course you have a mandate. You have a mandate to do, to fill in the blanks, yes. So his, his but, but in, a, in point of fact, his message throughout the campaign was turning around and bringing back Illinois. Now he's filling in some of those blanks and then people can make their own decisions about whether which okay. component parts they like or don't like. But, 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 but remember, it wasn't just people who voted for Bruce Rauner. It was also that more than seven in 10 Illinoisans thought the state was on the wrong track. So that says we need to do something different than we're doing. And frankly, everybody understands that because if you have a conversation with almost anybody with the means of mobility in the state, and I mean the means to rent a U-Haul truck, within about a minute or a minute and a half, they're talking to you about their exit strategy from Illinois. Almost everybody's talking to you about exit strategy. I mean, you just like walk up to anybody, you walk up to John Tillman, you know, the head of the Illinois Policy Institute, and John's thinking of leaving the state. You walk up to people that are rank and file taxpayers, and you invariably move to a conversation about, my kid went away to college, he's not coming back because there's not job opportunities here in the profession that he wants to, to apply his, his skills. Uh, I'm, I'm a couple years from retirement, and as soon as I retire, we're out of here, or at least we're seriously thinking about it. When the kids get out of school, we're out of here, or at least we're seriously thinking about it. We've net lost a million and a half people over the last 15 years, and that is not... Uh, that a is million not, and a half people have left Illinois net, net in the last that, 15 years? And that is, What's and the population currently? 13 million, roughly. It used to be 14.5? And, 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 the, the, and the point is that on an annual basis, Illinois is near the top in net out migration, you know, kind of usually competing with New Jersey. People are voting with their feet because they look around okay. and they see that there is a better quality of life at a lower cost in a lot of neighboring states, in states like Tennessee and Texas and Florida. Can they and elsewhere. offer the same cultural things? Like if you go just to Indiana, where people say that's more popular, you know, Chicago becomes a much more of a trip. Can you go down to the Art Institute in, the, in, in Indianapolis? Can you go to the Field Museum? Can you have the same bar scene? Can you have the same vibrancy to the city? I mean, really, you'd have to concede a lot of people ain't leaving Chicago no matter what you're due to no Texas. No kidding. I'm one of them. Yeah. I mean, I love Chicago. Of course, Chicago's yeah. a great city. So, and, yeah. And, so and there's, you can't, yeah, you can't yeah. get the cultural experience that you get in Chicago in very many right. cities. Uh, and all the diversity of experiences. And, Paul Green says and, and you need a lot of grease to have that. That's why he says you need no. grease. You yeah. know the Paul Green grease theory, right? You know Paul Green, Roosevelt University yes, professor? Yes, I know Paul He Green. says you, he would lump you in with the goo-goo reformers. He said you think you can just be so good and reformed about government, sometimes you need a little grease to get these things done. To, I don't know To what get that the means. Field Museum, to get the yes. Art Institute, to get the you know what, scene, You know what that you know? sounds like to me? That sounds like a rationale for the kleptocracy that we have. And, that's, and it's, it's that kind of simplistic thinking. It's kind of the kind of, this is how the city works. Is the University of Chicago PhD? This is, this is the, how the city works, and this is how we make it work in Chicago. This is the Chicago way kind of nonsense. That is the reason Chicago okay. is bankrupt. Okay. That is the reason we can't, we don't have the uh, policing we should have on the west side and the south side. So you have a great city with a few bright, shiny wards that generate most of the income for the city. And in the other 44, 45 wards, things aren't so great. So you're saying and there's, and, and there's a hollowing out going on in Chicago, just as there is in Illinois more generally, which is middle income people can't make it work here. So you have a lot of people that are insulated from terrible public policy decisions. Limousine liberals, like Paul Green's friends, and state dependents, and not a lot in the middle. You have to be killing it to live in the city of Chicago comfortably. It is increasingly difficult to do so. And it shouldn't be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. 
So it's interesting, Chewy Garcia was right when he said to Rahm Emanuel, we have this shiny city, but you have these other wards who are all in trouble. You've just said That's you correct. might have four or five wards that are doing well, and then 50, 45 wards are doing poorly. You're on the same track. You're okay with what Chewy was saying, at least there. Is yeah, that right? he, 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 it's a description of the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. And since okay. Chewy lives, you know, Little Village or Pilsen, I can't remember which, but he, he sees it. Yeah. He, he's right. He, he was sees right those about words that. where it's not and, functioning. And okay. he's not the only one. Everybody sees if it. If you could have gotten Chewy to agree with you on school vouchers, school choice, lower taxes, lower spending, you and Chewy could be strange bedfellows, right? Yeah, well, sure. I yeah. mean, it's about policy, there is some not personality. There is some common ground between you and Shui, at least on that score. Well, in terms of the shiny city, yeah. in terms of describing the reality okay. on the ground, yes. Okay. I, so. You know, I, it's Rom and the others who want you to ignore evidence. Don't believe your lying eyes. Listen to what I'm saying. Well, uh, I'm not on board for that. Okay. So let me just. Uh, we got to go on, and we're going to. But I, I want to just sort of close it off on the property tax. So the freeze that Rauner's proposing would freeze indefinitely any increase in the property tax rate. You'd, say, you'd have to seek. Did I, did I state that correctly? You'd have to, in the levy, you'd have to seek. In the levy, any the increase in the levy. local units of government would be, uh, would, would be empowered, as they are now, uh, but you'd have to seek a referendum. No, I mean, it's, there's. You there's would have to seek a referendum. Local referendum. That's the law he has in mind, is that if you went to a referendum and the majority of the people said locally they wanted to raise the property tax levy rate, then they could do that. Correct. And my point also is that you think he would have embedded in that law, as a part of that law, better way of putting it, not embedded, the right of the government to curtail collective bargaining on salaries, on pensions with their public sector unions, because he would say, and maybe you would too, that's a way of controlling their costs, which allows them to live with it more easily within these property tax frozen levies. Well, I would say one thing. One, on the property tax issue, you would probably face a court challenge, and the courts have consistently ruled in favor of home rule communities. Which uh, means what? So, you know, there's a, there's a question about what could be done with respect to that backdoor referendum. In terms of collective bargaining, I'm not, he's not talking about curtailing collective bargaining rates. Really? He's talking about empowering local units of government in the collective bargaining process. Um, that's, that's the that, same that's, thing. That's, it's, that's empower, it's empowering local governments to curtail, to decide that they don't want to include cur, uh, collective, they don't want to include pension salary, salaries and pension benefits as a part of collective bargaining. Well, I would, they want, I would to, call they it, want to set that. I would call like it worker freedom. Uh, that's what, that's what he's talking about freedom? at the local Meaning level. What, and what does that mean to you? Well, that, what, what it means to Bruce to, Rahner yeah. is worker freedom. If you want to be part of a union, be part of a union. If you don't want to be part of a union, you don't have to be part of a union. That's what he. That's what he. How he would describe it. No, but didn't in in Wisconsin. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I think it's really an important point. So I'm going to take another minute or two. Didn't in Wisconsin Scott Walker enact these changes so that local governments would not collectively bargain on salaries? He gave them the right to, and apparently they chose, as I understand it not to collectively bargain salaries and pension benefits. The ironic thing is... I'm just saying, did he do that, and do you want to use that at all as a model for what Illinois should do? Well, I, I, I'm not the governor, so I don't, I'm not wanting to do anything. I'm describing or what, what the governor is right. Do you think he's trying to do what Governor Walker I think Walker he's did? Uh, some approximation of it, um, though it's worth noting, if you look in other states like Indiana and Wisconsin that have moved away, uh, that have moved towards right to work, I should say, work or freedom, um, their union membership is actually up. So, right. so it's, well, they, it's empowering. And worker freedom means a, it's empowering the worker Rauner's to make a talk, choice. Rauner's spoken of right to work zones. Right. And, and so that would be right to work zones means what? Well, it would mean exactly what we're talking about in certain Local places. governments so, could so, choose, uh, like Rockford or Decatur could vote and say, we are right to work, meaning you don't have to join a union in order to work at an establishment. Is that, and they say that's the zone. The whole state of Illinois is not right to work, but Winneka could be, Decatur right. could and be. And that's what you saw the first half of this okay. year with these resolutions that were being voted okay. up or down by local units of government, municipalities, Would that counties. pass on an up or down vote? That law that gave local governments the right to do that, and you say Rauner wants that, you said various things you think given a right to, given an up or down vote would pass. Property taxes, as we've just discussed, 
property tax freeze, as you say, would pass, and would right to work zones, would that also pass? No. Okay. So, so far, we've got one thing of the round or well, turnaround. Well, I suggested that you would have a lot of po popular pressure on term limits, which is something else Term limits. Included. Okay, let's go back to that. The term limits would mean approximately what, as you understand, rounder, with respect to state legislators, statewide office? What would it mean? Yeah, it would be all of the above. He wants term limits. I mean, his proposal state, is term limits state across reps, the board. State senators, statewide office, governor, right. and so forth. It has not state been spelled officials. out. It has not been spelled out. Has it yet in proposed legislation as to whether the term for a governor might be one term, two terms, three terms? I, I, think, I, I think he's talked about two terms for a governor. How long and, for a state senator? I, you know, I, I don't know exactly. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, most of the proposals usually come in around 10 or 12 years. And, and But have any of these things been reduced to bill form and submitted to the General Assembly for vote? Well, there, well uh, there's, there's, there's no vote because Madigan will okay, call no, any of these they, bills. But has some Republican, they're still allowed to there's, introduce there's a been, bill, there's right? Been bills, there's there have been, been bills, bills introduced? Bills filed. Filed. Yes, bills filed on all, on, of, these on all of these topics. Really? Of course. Okay. So for years, tax, even before Rotter, for that matter. Really? On a right to work zone that was filed for years? Um, well, I don't about right to work zones, but you've had you've had okay. various iterations of of okay. uh, public sector union reform that have been filed in bill so, form. But now, as I understand it, what he wants specifically, the governor, tell me if I'm wrong, he wants the he wants Madigan and Cullerton to agree that the general assembly would give a vote on term limits and on redistricting. Do you think I'm right on that? Well, I think that this is all part of a negotiation. It's very difficult to know where the give is and where the given isn't because, uh, where the give isn't, I should say, because Ronner's not going to telegraph where he's willing to compromise. That's why you I sit at a bargaining he, table. Okay, so. I mean, so, so. But he says he wants that. Well, I mean, of course he, yeah, course. I mean, redistricting whether he would re and term whether, limits yeah. are part of his agenda. Whether or not those are deal breakers is not at all clear. I don't think he has deal breakers. I think yeah. he wants to get uh, a, a, at least okay. a couple component parts of his turnaround agenda before he discusses anything in terms of revenue, and that's that's what he should do. I mean, we, we, the, the idea that we're just going to talk about revenue and how we increase revenue to increase or to maintain current levels of state spending is silliness, and he understands that. So he's not uh, uh, he's not going to buy that approach to kind of bending over for Madigan and Cullerton to propagate a status quo that he was elected to upset. Okay, uh, but some, okay, term limit vote, redistricting vote, property tax freeze. Workers' comp is a huge issue. Work, workman's comp, okay, and what does he want in terms of workman's comp? He wants reforms to things like the definition of workplace injuries and, and the like so that you bring workers' comp costs more in line with our neighboring states. I mean, it's just, you, you had a company. By definition, excuse me, by definition of injury, what do you mean? Well, so for example, if you uh, s slip and fall on your sidewalk at home, that is not a workplace injury. But when you go to these uh, kangaroo courts and litigate the matter with the union in terms of what constitutes a workman's comp eligible injury, uh, the state and uh, taxpayers uh, invariably lose. So the point is to tighten up those definitions so that people who are legitimately injured on the job can access workers' comp benefits Disability benefits, fine, but gaming. So that's a causation issue. That sometimes but, but, people refer to this as yeah, but, cleaning up the causation issue. Yeah, but game, what's the prevailing wage issue, and what does he want done? Well, he, I, I, again, this is all part of kind of negotiating uh, down some of the public sector union influence, and this also would include the trades, because it, uh, in his mind, in uh, unnaturally inflates the cost of transportation infrastructure. And again, transportation infrastructure is our competitive advantage in the global economy, and it's one of the four main things that state government does where we spend most of our money. Wait, how does prevailing wage, how does, what, how does the prevailing wage affect the transportation in Illinois or Chicago? Because of the cost of uh, road construction projects and the like. Me, and the prevailing wage means it's similar to Davis-Bacon, it means by law in Illinois, government units agree they will only hire people who in turn hire people, contractors, who pay the so-called prevailing wage, which means a union wage. Right. And that is actually reduced to specific numbers for specific jobs in legislation somewhere. 
So I'm told same time sometimes for people like sign holders, you see these people holding signs on the roads that say slow down, they're paid $125 an hour. Whether that's really true or not, I think I heard maybe Matt Besler say that at the Illinois Policy Institute on one of their programs on the turnaround agenda. Does it sound like that, that if that's true, that's an issue and that's the kind of thing he wants cleaned up or cleaned up in maybe the wrong word. If you have reform of those work, of those uh, prevailing wage issues, you might pay this person $15 an hour or $10 an hour as opposed to you know, $100 an hour. Well, the, well that would I, tremendously affect, you're saying, transportation I mean, competitiveness, about, yeah, construction are, competitiveness, these are obviously, local government competitiveness. Uh, these are obviously uh, contracts and projects that are in the tens, hundreds of million, billions of dollars. So it's substantial. But, but I, I go It also back. means jobs, right? If you improve the um, economy, you're going to have more jobs in Illinois or not? Well, what I would say about this, I go back again, it's very easy to get into the weeds and kind of pick these line items under a heading. Uh -huh. The conversation uh, we should be having is about rethinking how we do where we spend 85% of the cash. Okay. So it, transportation infrastructure, that conversation is so much bigger and broader than prevailing wage. K through 12 education is so much bigger and broader than just teacher pensions. Uh, Medicaid is so much bigger and broader than even the Obama uh, Medicaid expansion that Paquin was so eagerly adopted. Uh, and, pu and public sector pensions, it's so much bigger than, you know, the, the cost of living adjustment or increasing the retirement age or these tweaks to the, to the structure of those pension systems and the obligations they, they foist upon the public. You have to rethink all of these systems. $214 billion in debt, $30 billion in assets. That's like if you were a $50,000 a year worker you amass $305,000 in credit card debt, how are you gonna pay that off? You're not gonna be able to make the minimum monthly payments. And we can't now, and in addition to that- You need a restructuring. You need bankruptcy and, 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 bankruptcy and a restructuring. Well, and in addition to that, we're continuing to spend at the level that got us $305,000 okay. in credit card debt. So if you're not having that conversation, you're having the wrong conversation. But Dan, this sounds like the guy I knew in 2010 who was running for governor. Should you have well, the conversation hasn't changed. It's just gotten it's just gotten worse, right? It's been the same trajectory. Well, you were like supposed this, to have all this impact. Like this. Didn't you revolutionize that debate because you introduced all of these ideas to people like Brady and, and well, uh, Dillard and whoever else? Who were you running for with? Who else were you running? Many, against? many candidates. Many? Yeah. Uh, no, but, but seriously. But, but I think Bruce Rauner, to some extent, adopted uh, some of what I was saying in 2010. He's following. Rauner's well, I'm, following. I'm not saying he's following doctrine. me. I'm not the only one who yeah. understands that, that the, yeah. these things need to happen. Yeah. But, but, that's but, the but, point. but he is changing okay. the conversation, and that's the continuum. Change the conversation. You change people's okay. opinions by informing them. They make different decisions on Election Day. We get different policymakers that make different policy choices. It's a continuum. Well, what are the chances that. Speaker Mike Madigan, who's been speaker for all but two years, for 30 years except for two when he took a coffee break in 95, 96. And Cullerton, as you point out, has been a state senator for like four decades and now has been Senate president for the last, what, six or seven years. Are these guys going to say, oh, Dan, that's a very persuasive argument. Sure, we'll change everything. We'll change the system. No. They've got like mega majorities, super majorities. Right. Why should they? They were going to bargain. They're not. The They're question, not going to. So, well, the, if they if they don't if they don't bargain, then everybody would like to know the answer. Dan, the question is: You at WIND every month, every weekday, Monday through Friday, five to five a.m. to nine a.m. Nine a.m. People can find you five sixty a.m. radio. On the answer, and the question is: What can Rauner do to bring about some of these changes? Understanding the political reality that he faces in terms of the major league control that Cullerton and Speaker Madigan exercise? Well, well, I mean, uh, medium term, the thing that he... Short term. The thing that he We're taping do. this on August 24th. <laughs> Give him advice. What does he do this week? Well, I just want... What does he do this week? I just want people to understand, medium term, you have got to change the balance of power in the state legislature. That means the electing Assembly. state reps and state senators who follow what Rauner says. Well, so that's another two years well, well, at least. Well, well, right? we're, yeah, 18 Year and months. Half. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, before that, but, can but, I mean, do but, anything but, today? But, but, but that's important. I just want just, to just make it that point, yes. okay? Yes. And the point is, at the end of the day, you have got to win elections. 
This is something the Republican Party has seemed to have forgotten in this state. You have got to win elections as the means to policy ends, not as the means to be the junior partner to the Democrats, which is what Republicans have been for far too long. I think Ron is starting to change that. Really important. In the short term, look, you have got to be willing. He has got to make a stand in the first year. If he doesn't make this stand now, if he doesn't dig in now, then his his tenure is lost. His first term is lost. Is his stand and so on that, is and, his that, and that means and that means things like contemplating a walkout of state employees, contemplating a Chicago teacher strike. But he may have that, contemplating patcoing some state employees. He may have that taken away from him because Senate Bill does what? Senate Bill twelve twenty nine. And it's now passed the Senate. It's before the House. Well it's overriding his veto. Okay, over right. it's already passed. In He's veto it. And the Senate has already passed an override. If the House right. does, that would do what? That would essentially take the governor out of the collective bargaining process. And he put couldn't do any of these things you just said he could do, like Petco. He should have a lockout. He should say, "Oh, you I guys, don't know. I don't know that." Well, he, he will could, he be able to do any of those well, things? He, he he's still in a position to uh, riff state workers. To I mean, look, if I, he can't I reach agreement, if he can't reach agreement with the public sector unions. It, this law would say that means it goes to arbitration. And right. you're saying the arbitrators will f find a way to side with the state employees. Well, that's what they usually do. Okay, so what can he do if that override occurs and he's faced with that law? Look, I mean, irrespective of that law, the issue is at some point there have got to be consequences imposed if the public sector unions and the politicians they control are so intransigent, so uninterested in the economic future of this state, that they will not give anything. That's where they have been for the last two months with Ronner. Now, I think there's, I, I suspect there's going to be some movement. I don't know whatever agreement is reached, if it's going to be substantial change or kind of change on the outside to protect uh, status quo on the inside. So we'll see. But, but the, you have got to be willing to make the really tough decisions. You have got to be willing to uh, uh, to have Springfield under siege the way Madison was in, in Scott Walker's first term. Should he do anything in terms of new revenue? Because some people say if he, if he wants some of these things, he has to give these leaders of the Democratic Party some new revenue. He should modernize the sales tax, which means extending the base of the sales tax in Illinois to include services, right. which is another $700 million. Some people say, you know, the tax rate went four years ago, income tax rate, and corresponding corporate tax rate from 3% to 5%, and then it had a sunset back to 3.75, which occurred eight months ago. Some say he has to give on that a little bit, let it go up maybe another point to 475. That would give the government $3 billion. Should he, what should he do in terms of new revenue, if anything, Dan Proft? Well, I, 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 think, Governor Rauner. I think increasing a structural tax like the income tax would be a huge mistake. Okay. I absolutely do not think What about the sales tax modernization to extend to include sub -resources? You know, a consumption tax is less offensive. Um, extending it so it's, it's, it's more aligned with the basket of goods and services that uh, have sales tax attached to it in neighboring states like Indiana it offends me less as long as he gets structural tax relief and spending constraints in exchange for that. So the, the real issue is what does he get does he if get? he's willing to extend the sales tax to services? If he extended, which gives him $700 million, but he didn't raise the income tax rate at all, and he got an agreement by the general, by Madigan and Cullerton to put up for a vote in the General Assembly, redistricting and term limits that is putting that on the ballot to amend the Constitution to have those no. things occur. That, that, would, be not be a, that would, would not be enough for you. It wouldn't be enough for me. It may be enough for him. I don't know. I don't know what he wants. Well, it would be enough. Be... Jacobson and Proft, okay? It's every, <laughs> every weekday morning, 5 to 9 a.m. It's the answer. It's WIND, 560 a.m. radio. Look, Dan and I kid around a lot, but really he's a smart guy. As I said, he went to, maybe I didn't say, he went to Northwestern. Just we Not tape something Evanston. I'm proud of, but yeah. It's a good school. He went to, got his law degree from Loyola. I've been kidding him. He's procrastinating in, in terms of taking the bar exam, right? Yeah, I mean, it's You, you like make it to every other bar in town. <laughs> yeah, Should you get right. the bar review? <laughs>